constant state of flux, continually evolving in an environment filled with disruptive influences. From mixed reality experiences to networked wearable technology, we're able to connect faster than ever before. Our behaviour as businesses, employees and customers will also continue to change and our future will be determined by how we respond. New connections and technology will lead to unparalleled discoveries. It's more than just understanding what to do with these advancements. In fields as diverse as artificial intelligence, robotics and smart sensors, it's having an eye on what's to come. This is an exciting world rich with opportunities and challenges that together we understand. QUT is a university for the real world of today and tomorrow. Join us for the Real World Futures program and learn more about future working, future thinking and future living. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Danielle Jewell, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to today's event and to be your MC for the morning. It's actually the 18th event in the Real World Futures program, which commenced in 2015. Since then, we've been exploring the impacts and opportunities of diverse technologies and innovations through the perspectives of future living, future thinking, and future working. Today's event is called Connected Cities, Connected People. The city of the near future is emerging as a more efficient, more functional, more connected one. This will affect how we work, how we commute, and how we spend our leisure time. It may even affect the way we relate to one another and how we think about the world. But before we go any further, in keeping with the spirit of reconciliation, I wish to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land where QUT now stands. I'd like to pay respect to their elders, past, present and emerging, and to recognise that these have always been places of teaching and learning. And the important role that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people continue to play within the QUT community. One of the central ideas that we're propounding today is that connected cities, sometimes referred to as smart cities, exist to serve people, not the other way around. However, Wikipedia's definition of a smart city does not really put humans at the centre of their design. Wikipedia defines a smart city as an urban development vision to integrate information and communication technology and Internet of Things technology in a secure fashion to manage a city's assets. I guess one question that this definition raises is how do we define assets? Are they simply infrastructure and perhaps data? Or might we define a city's assets more broadly to include its air, water quality, public space, public art, and other items that may not appear on a typical balance sheet? Most people in this room would be aware of the federal government's smart cities plan, which does at least on the surface appear to consider the human factors. On their website, you'll find that the smart, smart cities plan will position our cities to succeed in the 21st century economy. It's a plan for supporting productive, accessible, livable cities that attract talent, encourage innovation and create jobs and growth. The Smart Cities Plan represents a new framework for cities policy at the federal level, and it's a framework for smart investment, smart policy, smart and smart technology that will guide action across various portfolios to deliver better outcomes for our cities, the people who live in them, and all Australians. Well, we're very fortunate that we have some very smart people on stage or here to be on stage today. And I can promise you, you will hear much about smart policy, smart technology and smart investment. And most importantly, the implications for the people who live in these smart cities. We'll consider how our lives in cities are becoming more augmented with better public transportation systems, quicker responses from police and fire services, and more efficient energy consumption. We'll touch on the opportunities for business to create value in this connected marketplace. And we'll be encouraged to reflect on the potential dystopian impacts that heightened connectivity could bring, 
such as dwindling privacy and imperiled personal data. We have an action-packed agenda for you, with six speakers who will each share a brief message with us. Then I'll bring our speakers together on stage for a Q&A session, so you have the chance to dig deeper and pose your own questions to them. We'll wrap up just after 9am, so those of you who do need to race back to the office can do so, and those of you who don't can linger a little longer to network for a while. Before I invite our first speaker on stage, a little bit of housekeeping. If you need to use the bathrooms, they're located one level down on level nine. Uh, you can access them via the lift or the external stairs. In the unlikely case of an emergency, uh, could you please exit via the external stairs? And throughout the event, I encourage everyone to follow the conversation on Twitter at Real World Futures, at Real World Future, I should say. And you can join the conversation by using the hashtag future working. Now allow me to introduce our first speaker. Our first speaker is Professor Margaret Petty. Margaret grew up in the Pacific Northwest of the United States, but has spent her life in motion, moving every three to five years consistently. This constant reinvention has informed her interest in historical narratives and themes that cut across time and place, which led her to study art architecture and design history, as well as material culture and cultural history. It is Margaret's passion and ambition to harness the greater perspective familiar to the historian to help lead and guide an agenda of change, positive impact and leadership for design, whether the challenge at hand be connected cities or the transformation of manufacturing or fostering more sustainable consumer practices through design. Margaret believes that collectively, they all contribute to the greater goal of making the world and society healthier, happier, sustainable and equitable. In her opening remarks, Margaret will be offering an historical overview of the pursuit of smarter, healthier, more livable, more equitable, more, success more successful and sustainable cities. We've invited Margaret to open the conversation today to foreground the contemporary interest in smart cities with a much longer and sustained dialogue about cities and people, and the important lessons learned about keeping people rather than technology at the heart of what makes our cities great. Please join me in welcoming Professor Margaret Petty. Thank you. Thank you so much, Danielle, for that um, really lovely introduction. Um, let's see, I'd like to begin here. This is there we go. Um, so when I was invited by David Fagan to speak at today's um, conversation, I felt a little bit like Tony. For those of you that are familiar with the show Utopia, when Rhonda busts into the office and says, smart cities, that's what people want to hear about. And Tony says, I, I don't really know anything about smart cities. And you know, my response is, I'm a historian. Uh, I work with fabulous people that know all about IoT and robotics and urban planning. Um, you know, I'm a historian. I can talk about James Jacobs or Le Corbusier, uh, you know, and Rhonda, or David was very kind. He didn't do this, would say, get over it, Grandma. Get with it. This is about the future. Um, so I thought, OK, um, actually, uh, the past is all about the future because at any point in history, and the great thing about being a historian is it's like being a train conductor. You decide where the train stops and where it starts. Um, and you get to tell a bit of a story about it. But no matter where you stop, generally speaking, humans are looking to the future and are trying to figure out what we can do better and how we can change what we do today to get to where we want to be. So the first stop on our train this morning, which is going to move very quickly, it's a very modern train, um, I've got five minutes, uh, is the beginning of what many of us would think of as the modern era with industrialization in the 19th century, which really drove people to urban centers in unprecedented numbers um, with really catastrophic effects on the environment, on um, uh, human condition, uh, inequality, all of the things that we're still struggling with today. So, very rapidly, once industrialization got underway, 
we see a response and a human response looking to the future. So even as early as the uh, very end of the 19th century, we see Ebenezer's ha Ebenezer Howard's introduction of Garden Cities, which was really the idea of how could you bring the best of, of um, town and country together so that we could live in societies that had green spaces, that had work, that had um, ways to commute and have schools and were well taken care of. Um, more of a, a bit of a socialist, really putting people at the center of things. And the United States at the same time, we had the City Beautiful movement, which was really about designing cities that would inspire um, civic participation, that would inspire uh, people to um, live to the ideals of uh, a kind of American civic uh, democracy, uh, more top down. But again, trying to use infrastructure and city planning as a way to um, make our lives better. And this was uh, displayed as kind of symbolic universes at world's fairs so that you could walk through uh, an orientation where everything is in its place and there's a place for everything in our lives. Now, that um, continuing migration to the cities uh, accelerated uh, quite rapidly at the beginning of the 20th century. New York City, for example, in the 1840s had a population of about 300,000. And by 1910, it was four and a half million. So um, when we talk about the growth of megacities, again, this is not new. Um, this is a problem we've been dealing with. So the um, uh, steel cage construction, uh, glass architecture, these were all seen as visions of the future where we had transparency, we would have hygienic, efficient, modern ways of housing ourselves and our businesses and our industries, and that that would be a better future. Uh, we had very utopianistic plans, whether you look at Le Corbusier's Plan Voisin or uh, Frank Lloyd Wright's Broadacre City. Again, it's the de desire to orient people uh, to work, to family, to city in a way that's more rational, more um, sustainable. But when we look to the past, we realize these didn't always work out. The idea of um, putting everyone in identical towers uh, in a small uh, area of land in the middle of a city and raising your historic districts didn't work out as well as we would have liked. Um, but at the time, um, there was lots of optimism about it. Now, this gets very uh, close to you know, my American sort of roots. Uh, in the United States uh, in the 1930s, as the uh, country was coming out of the Great Depression, Again, everyone was looking to the future. Futurama, what, what, what are we going to see? How are we going to lift ourselves from this economic depression? Uh, and it was all about consumption, very much driven by corporate America, cars, the idea that you would, everyone would have their own car and you would have this wonderful mobile automobile city. Um, we also know how that turned out, uh, you know, freeways and traffic jams and um, uh, the aspiration to solve things with infrastructure or technology uh, you know, was well-meaning, but often um, we didn't predict exactly how that would come to pass. Now, um, our cities today in many ways are hybrids of all of these things that we've looked at. We have green spaces, we have highways coming through and bisecting our uh, traditional districts, uh, skyscrapers, um, and we also have uh, ever-increasing megacities, cities of 10 uh, million or more, where uh, inequality and um, uh, pollution and uh, the drain on resources and, and the impact on the environment is really incredible. So, oh, sorry, um, this was a slightly different PowerPoint than I thought, but it doesn't matter. Um, more importantly, uh, what I want to talk about is the continuing a continuity um, across all of these movements and all of these brands of cities, whether it's the city beautiful, um, the garden city, uh, the automobile city, they all have something in common, and that's people. And that's what we're here to talk about today. So I you know, can't tell you too much about big data or IoT, um, but we have some terrific people here who can. But as the historian um, who's always looking to the future through the past, the question is really how do we have sustainable cities that have people at the center that provide for the lifestyle we want for our children, that preserve the culture, that um, make room for commerce, that has uh, you know, affordable, healthy, sustainable transportation, fundamental problems. And we may not get it right. We probably won't get it right. We haven't got it right yet. But we have to keep trying. And that's a great thing about what we do. So thank you so much, everyone.
Thank you for setting the scene there, Margaret. Our second speaker, Professor Laurie Byers, is a social scientist, a rehabilitation counsellor and a gerontologist by trade. In case you're wondering, as I was, a gerontologist is a healthcare professional who specialises in the field of ageing-related dimensions of change over a lifetime. Laurie grew up in rural West Virginia in the US in a very small town of about 3,000 people. She's passionate about people and believes people are more important than technology. Through her research in her role as Professor of Social Change at the Creative Industries Faculty at QUT, Laurie hopes to achieve greater understanding of the complexity of the interactions between people, places and activities, as this understanding gives us an opportunity to create great places for communities that include older people. Margaret is adamant that a birthday, or the fact that we may have had a lot of them, does not limit our value to society, nor our ability to make meaningful contributions. Here today to talk to us about our quality of life in an urban setting, or in other words, livability, please welcome Professor Laurie Byers. Good morning, everyone. Um, as Danielle said, um, smart cities and livability are inextricably linked. They're often talked about in the, in the same breath. So I'd like to unpack that a little bit this morning. So at the Commonwealth level, livability is um, seen as livable cities. Vibrant cities are absolutely critical to our prosperity. They're economic assets. But what's really interesting is the last point that Malcolm Turnbull makes. It's Valuable capital in the world today is not financial capital, it's human capital. Oops, I'm going the wrong way. Okay, there we are. So what is livability? So livability is really about the quality of life of our community. It involves a whole lot of things, it's complex. Um, it involves the built and natural environments, the economic prosperity, the social stability, education, cultural, entertainment, recreation. So it involves a whole lot of things. But at the end of the day, livability is about a great place to live, work and play. So that's what, it's, what our aim is, that's what the city's aim is. It's about creating great places for us to be. So livability brings in people. We're all here. We're all interacting with each other. But we're also in a place. It's about great places in the city. And it's also about the things that we're doing, working, playing, interacting, and so forth. So the three key words that you can't get away from in terms of a city are about relationships. It's our relationships with each other and our individual relationships with the natural and built environment and the things that we want to do. It's about being connected. We're connected with each other and we're connected again with our environment. But we're also engaged. A vibrant city, a smart city, and a livable city have engaged people. Without engaged people, we actually don't have, basically don't have a city. So if you look at pictures of our city, if you wander around our city on your way out from this, this talk this morning, have a look around. You don't just see one thing. You see people, you see people interacting in our environment, and you see the built, you see the natural. You can't get away from all those interactions. What's interesting is that in Sydney, they did a, um, a, a domain, Livable Sydney, and they had identified the 16 factors that inform, and I stress inform, a suburb's livability factor. And the 16 factors won't surprise you. They, they come up everywhere, they're things that are important to all of us. But what the main thing is, is we need to remember that these factors are infrastructure. They're infrastructure. Infrastructure doesn't necessarily create livability, but it certainly underpins livability. It creates livability. So if we go to Smart City, and Danielle already brought up the Wikipedia um, definition, and it's about integrating technology and communication technology into manage a city's assets. So what does that mean? What I think that means is actually about connecting the infrastructure. So it's connecting the infrastructure that we talked about in the previous slide. It's making all of that work for us. So basically, infrastructure is not the end game. Infrastructure is not the goal, 
Livability is our goal. It's all about people, places and pursuits. And, and it's the infrastructure that supports it that to create it. So if we lose track and we actually make that the infrastructure is the end game, we end up with a whole lot of what we call white elephants. So rather than having white elephants, we want to have infrastructure that works for us. So it means that people need to be put at the, the forefront of absolutely everything that we do in smart cities. Thank you. Thank you, Laurie. We're moving quickly to allow time for Q&A at the end. Our next speaker, Mr. Lou Boyle, is the Innovation Executive at the Local Government Association of Queensland. In this role, Lou is responsible for raising awareness and implementing solutions through the use of technology that will improve the efficiency and service delivery of councils. During his time in this role, Lou has created the Industry Development Fund, which helps provide funding to test on potential technology and telecommunication advancements for councils. Furthermore, he has helped improve connectivity in rural areas through working with councils to install optic fibre and upgrading exchanges that allow rural communities to access broadband services. Before working at the association, Lou had a number of senior executive roles at Telstra. In his 16 years there, he worked with the Commonwealth State and Councils to build more than 160 mobile phone base stations, including the construction of the first mobile phone coverage to Cape York and Torres Strait Islands. He was a key figure in the development of Telstra's national approach in rural and regional Australia, including being one of the first managers in the creation of Telstra Countrywide. Lou has further driven installation of 230 exchange upgrades, allowing rural communities access to community and enterprise broadband. On a lighter note, Lou is regarded as the champion footy tipster at uh, the Local Government Association of Queensland, having won five out of the past six competitions, which he informs me has been in 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 achieved through the use of data. <laughs> Now, Lou is here today to talk to us about connected cities, but it, that it's more than connected cities, it's about com connected communities. And it's not just where you live, it's how you live. Please welcome Mr Lou Boyle to the stage. Good morning, thank you very much for having me today. Um, as mentioned, my name is Lou Boyle. I work for the Local Government Association of Queensland and we have a passion. We want our councils to be the best possible that they can be. And we recognise the role that um, technology plays in that uh, in, in going forward with our councils. Just want to touch upon a few points very quickly today, where, where our councils are, how they approach technology, what they're, what they're actually doing out there. Uh, the concept of smart, and that's obviously you know, been recognised uh, already. Uh, telecommunications policy and the role of the Commonwealth, which is a really key area, and that's going to have a profound effect with some of the stuff that's currently on the table with the Commonwealth. And, um, and this area about not another gap. So I really wanted to sort of target, while we talk about smart cities, the area that I'm really interested in, I think smart cities is a misnomer. I think we should be talking about smart communities because of the nature of technology being ubiquitous. It really should be any community, any council. You know, should be able to take upon the sort of advantages from it and deliver services more effectively. We're a big believer that a, a, a smart community or city should be a, a citizen-centric one. And coming from local government where you know, we are that closest level of government to the people, it makes a lot of sense that we're ha having our councils as efficient as possible, having services delivered in new ways, having that greater closeness with, with the people that make up those communities. So I'll just go through this pretty quickly. I guess the key thing is, and you know, we're a big believer in the World Economic Forum and some of the stuff that comes out of there, and we do know we live in really interesting times, you know, this concept of um, a promise or peril. And part of the work that we try to do with councils is just try to raise their awareness and understanding. We do a lot of work around uh, certainly trying to demystify technology, and we also do a lot of research work as well. And when we talk to councils about how they're adopting technology, we always get three or four common themes that come out of it. Certainly they recognise the correlation between investing in technology and getting an outcome. And that outcome could be a productivity outcome, it could be efficiency, it could be how we deliver services more effectively to our community, which is great because that's half the battle. However, 
The biggest issue is we don't know what's out there. Technology moves too quickly. We don't know who we can trust. There's so many suppliers and everybody's had a bad experience with the supplier, more or less. Um, we're not sure if we've got the skills to actually do this stuff because it's like, it's all technology, it's really complex, right? And the other thing is, um, we're not sure if we can actually do it because we get these messages from the Commonwealth that we can't participate in the digital economy until the NBN comes to town. And um, so part of the work that I try to do is, is change those perceptions and actually say, well, look, you know, there's a lot of really nice stuff out there that's off the shelf, easy to implement, immediate returns on investment, either from a efficiency bottom line or how we deliver services. So I do a lot of work and time uh, in that specific space. We talk of smart communities and they're the things that we see happening out there. And that's probably not the greatest slides, but you know, it's about how we install, you know, bits and pieces into infrastructures that give us better understanding how we collect data, whether it's Wi-Fi, smart lights, meters, pumps, all those sort of things. Uh, lighting's a really important one uh, because you know, that's uh, quite uh, you know, significant in that that infrastructure allows for a lot of those you know, CCTV and Wi-Fi and you know, other sensors to be uh, hosted on and um, we're doing some work hopefully with the Queensland government where we might be able to have more smart lights in Queensland. Um, but the key thing about all this, of course, is that if we are talking about technology and we recognise that technology is the enabler, right, where are those communities in Queensland that don't have good technology? So, you know, our view is we want all our communities to be able to participate in the digital economy, both at the citizen level and the council level. But we recognise there's a number of gaps out there. And, you know, that's an old sort of map. Um, uh, but it certainly just gives a bit of indicator where, where the core infrastructure is and a bit of telecommunications 101, two types of network. There's the core network, which in the vast majority of instances is about uh, is an optic fibre network. There's about 40,000 kilometres or 42,000 kilometres of optic fibre in Queensland hanging off the optic, uh, of that core network that terminates and exchanges the access network, things like mobile phone base stations, um, eight different types of broadband technology that people actually connect to. Our biggest issue at the moment is that our extremities of that network are the ones that are underserved. Uh, so, you know, our fear is that, uh, and, and those communities right now are our Indigenous communities. We've, we've spent a lot of work and certainly, you know, the Queensland Government has been really run with a lot of this stuff, which has been great. Uh, you know, they've certainly put their money where their mouth is and made dollars available to fix up some of these communities. And indeed, you know, projects like the optic fibres out to Baku, Diamantina, Burke wouldn't have been possible without the Queensland Government. The frustrating thing is telecommunications is a Commonwealth responsibility. And when you're spending 50 or 60 billion on the NBN, whatever the real number is, going back and saying, we need some dollars to fix these communities. And they say, isn't the NBN going to fix that? And you go, no, it's not going to fix the communities. So this is where we're still having some challenge. Right now, our biggest focus is on the uh, Indigenous communities because they're the ones that don't have that network in place. Uh, and to, again, to the credit of the Queensland Government, they're being quite smart in how they're going forward. So. Right now, our issues are we've got really thin network in Cape York and the Torres Straits. Some communities have got good network, particularly where the Queensland government have been able to lever off some of the contract, and we've seen major infrastructure projects go to places like Aracoon. There's a uh, optic fibre being built as I speak, uh, hooking up um, Kawanyama to uh, Edward River. And these are going to be game changers for these communities. And I've got a slide later on that actually shows what that sort of difference is. Um, our sort of strategy is that, look, you know, getting the optifibre into these communities, really important. We'd love to see loops being made as well, but we're going to take it one step at a time. Obviously, when you have an optic fibre loop, if there's a cut, right, the, the, the communication still works because the nature of the rings are, uh, are self-healing. So keep in mind, too, that, you know, these communities are the most remote. And, you know, and telecommunications and the benefits of that is that if when they are the most relied upon, when, those, when the chips are down at those sort of like, you know, cyclones or other natural events. That's when you want to have good, good connectivity to deliver services. So it's really important that we try to have good, robust, scalable networks in these places. I mentioned before about the difference. I've got um, a couple of um, speed maps there, you know, the old speed map that you can do, app that you can do. Now, if you look up there, there's Kawanyam, Purumpara and Arakoon. Um, Purumpara and Arakoon have recently benefited from some of the uh, optic fibre upgrades, and that's resulted in 
carriers like Telstra putting in new base stations, they put in 4G. So you can see there's that uh, first lot of white numbers. You know, Kawanyama has got speeds of a uh, download speed of about 0.66 meg. All right. Prime Price at the upgrade, 70 meg. Aracoon, 57 meg. Download speeds, uh, sorry, upload speeds, 23 and uh, 15 respectively. So this is the sort of access and benefits that technology can, can provide to these communities once we get that infrastructure right. Um, we're still doing a lot of work with those communities. In fact, you know, we've just taken uh, a group of uh, Indigenous communities down to Sydney for a couple of days and basically trying to demystify how all this stuff works. Right? So it's not about technology, but understanding the benefits from it. So this idea that you know, having the core infrastructure is important, what hangs off it, the access, the mobile phone base stations, how people can participate. And we also recognise the challenges too. One of the issues that we have with our Indigenous communities is um, uh, and we've spent, been spending a fair bit of time up there, is they, they talk about this lack of respect for, for their elders and they recognise that from the next generation and they recognise that um, maybe there's some things that we could do through digital to actually start changing some of these behaviours. So we took them through um, Microsoft uh, yesterday, they had the HoloLens on and you know, they're looking at the 3D animals and all those sort of things and absolutely blown away. And the conversation that came out of that was how can we use this sort of technology to maintain our stories as a way of closing that gap between the generation that's coming through and the elders. How can we use technologies to preserve our language as a way of actually trying to, you know, make sure that our, our culture and, uh, you know, those sort of aspects are, are, are retained by uh, future generations. So this is some of the stuff that we want to go through with the councils. They're also investing in a lot of other smart projects as well. And this is all about you know, improving the livability of their communities. So we've involved in things like um, smart lighting and CCTV. And what we've seen straight away is reduction in antisocial behaviour. And there's been benefits um, all the way through the community. So obviously the communities become safer, but it's also resulted in a significant savings for the council as well, whereas they're not sort of repairing um, uh, things like um, you know, um, uh, damaged buildings or broken windows or graffiti. So there's been savings straight to the bottom line because there's been less clean up and the communities are better as well. So we're trying to do more of these sort of projects as well. Vehicle tracking, all our, or a lot of our Indigenous communities are using vehicle tracking and this is where uh, just understanding where the vehicle is but also fuel usage, how long the vehicle's been running. We've seen immediate returns on investment of that. Uh, they're using Wi-Fi, but it's Wi-Fi from a data perspective. So obviously, while um, participation is an issue for Indigenous communities, the device of choice is a mobile phone because of housing issues, so everybody's got a mobile, is how can we make those services more, more affordable? And Wi-Fi could be, um, you know, it's a great technology, it's got an evolution, but Wi-Fi could be a solution in a lot of those places. We're about to do some trials there. Some of our Indigenous communities are by using biometrics as a way of um, access to, to buildings and um, fuel depots and uh, other sort of depots. And uh, of course, smart meters and um, pumps are, are basically uh, rolling out more and more of these places as well. All are designed around improving efficiencies and those efficiencies are then being poured, passed on to the broader community as well, either in, in various different ways. Just give you one example, Hope Valley is a community, and this isn't uh, you know, a, a good slide, but um, basically it says the benefits that are obtained once we do get those, you know, that, that upgrade up there. Uh, so currently, uh, Hope Valley, you can see in the top sector, you know, services, whether it's flying doctor, police, council, whatever, you know, very limited in, in what can actually be delivered there. If we get the upgrade, we know there's going to be significant changes to those communities. And basically, that's all I wanted to say. So just a quick rundown of the work that we're trying to do with, with councils, in particularly with Indigenous councils, but we do recognise it shouldn't be a smart city conversation, but a smart community. And uh, if we get the technology right, anyone can play. Thank you. Great stuff, Lou, thank you. And there'll be uh, time to ask Lou some more questions uh, when we get to the Q&A. I'd now like to invite our next two speakers to the stage, please, Professor Michael Roseman and Ms Camilla Roberts. Many of you will have heard Michael speak at, um, at previous Real World Futures events. You may not know that he grew up in a little village south of Bremen in North Germany. Come on up, don't be shy, Michael. <laughs> Influenced by his father's attitude of you can only change tomorrow, he developed a strong sense for comprehending and designing emerging futures. In his time with us today, Michael will propose a data trading place for connected cities. 
that is an environment in which producers and consumers of data can interact and third party providers can offer their services such as data aggregation or data visualisation for example. Such an environment could be expanded with an emerging data tech community or entrepreneurial energy which further enriches the data related affordances of connected cities. Michael loves the intellectual challenges related to understanding and redesigning complex man-made systems. He hopes to open the minds and overall thinking abilities of emerging and current leaders so they are prepared to make the most out of our opportunity-rich environment. And Michael, we challenge you to open our minds today. Joining Michael on stage is Camilla Roberts. Camilla is a project director at the Institute for Future Environments here at QUT. She grew up in Brisbane and studied business at QUT, specialising in digital marketing and digital strategy. Camilla loves to draw together the talents of transdisciplinary teams to deliver visionary projects that utilise the power of digital. She actually had the opportunity to work for Jamie Oliver in London, running one of the largest digital food campaigns in the world, managing Emmy award-winning TV producers and Webby award digital producers, uh, developers to deliver it. In doing this, she witnessed a new era of digital people power, where motivating the masses online was creating a real world positive impact. The campaign she ran led to Jamie's TV series on obesity, which had a major impact in delivering the sugar tax in the UK. Now back at QUT as a project director, Camilla is here to talk to us about a data plan that QUT proposed for the Queen's Wharf project here in Brisbane. A data project of this scale spanning a 27 and a half hectare precinct over a long period of time would generate a cost prohibitive amount of data. So the QUT team have developed a method to prioritise the data. And to determine whether the data was worth collecting, Camilla and her team assessed it against a number of categories, including the value of the data to each stakeholder, its cost, ease of access, and the urgency with which the data was needed. And this has enhanced the value and sustainability of the proposed study. To tell us more about the project, I will now hand over to Camilla. Please give her a warm welcome. Thank you. So um, this is Southbank pre-development and um, at the time it was met with a deal of scepticism. Um, but I don't think anyone could deny how positive it's been for Brisbane. Uh, we weren't able to monitor its benefits and impacts at the time, but we do have this opportunity with the Queen's Wharf project and we're involved in proposing a study um, to study the Queen's Wharf project and how it might impact the city and the state. Uh, so you'll all be aware of Queen's Wharf, which is Queensland's largest ever development, um, costing $3 billion, being built over eight years, taking up 27 hectares of prime riverfront CBD Brisbane land. So it's of a scale to significantly impact the city, but also the state. And it's also of a scale to have a prohibitive amount of costly data collected. So we had the challenge of how do we make sure that we're collecting the highest value, most cost effective data so that um, the, the plan can be sustainable over time and we can truly measure the impacts before, during construction and once it's operational. And um, to do this, we developed a data prioritization matrix to really help us prioritize the, the pieces of data sets that we were being um, offered for this study. And there were four main categories that we looked at. We looked at the value of the data, the ease of access to that data, the cost of the data, and also the urgency of that data. And basically, the higher the score, the more likely we were to recommend it as a priority data set to use in the study. So beginning with value, we looked at two core areas within value. The first was we, uh, we, we looked at what were the desired impacts of Queen's Wharf, both socially and economically, um, for Brisbane and also for the wider state. And what are the data sets that will help us measure those desired impacts? The second thing that we looked at was how do we make this uh, a valuable data set to multiple stakeholders? So we use the value proposition canvas, which is in the background of that slide, to determine um, what different stakeholders saw as value in data. And we looked at businesses, the government, and the general public. 
And the second thing we considered was ease of access. And we considered that from the point of view of how easy the data is to acquire, but also how easy the insights are to gain from that data. So the consideration points for something like that might be, does the data set already exist? Is someone willing to share it with us? What's the quality of that data set? And does it contain any sensitive information? And sensitive information might include something that might identify someone, or it might contain information about harm or health. And this is generally a higher risk um, ease of access data set because it's going to come with greater restrictions or require um, greater cost to incentivize the respondents to answer honestly. Um, and then the other factor with that is the quality of the data. If, if you've given a free data set, but it's highly costly to try and access the insights in that data because it requires more cleaning and more analysis, then um, it's, going to score, it's going to score lower in the matrix on ease of access and also on cost of access. So this was the other consideration. As well as the acquisition costs, you also want to consider the ongoing costs. So although you might be able to obtain a free data set, if it costs more to access that, those insights, then those ongoing costs are something you need to, those um, cleaning costs are something you need to consider. And the other aspect is ongoing costs. If you're looking at a long-term study like we were, then you want to be able to access data sets that aren't going to suddenly have their prices hiked up when the data set provider might realize that you're dependent on that data set for 20 years. So we wanted to explore other ways of achieving um, the same sort of data, but more cheaply. And the final consideration for our matrix was the urgency of that data. So we looked at that from two perspectives. One was how urgently did the stakeholders need that information? And the second was um, how urgently do we need to record that data set now? Because, for example, the construction site is impacting that baseline data that we need to collect. And overall, um, if it was urgent, then it would score high on the matrix under urgency. And, and basically, the highest score were the data sets that we were most likely to recommend as the highest value to the most amount of people that could be achieved cost effectively. Um, because after all, piles and piles of data just don't matter. It's all about the insights they provide. Thank you. Thank you, Camilla. And good morning, everyone. So as Camilla highlighted, the future will be data rich. Um, and that's going to be the biggest consequence of all the technologies that we have in the making. Uh, we often look at data, we look at big data, and then we often think about analyzing, uh, slicing and dicing the data. But maybe look at data as an asset with some, some value. And Camilla just talked about what constitutes the value. Um, now, all of this happens, of course, in the context of the Internet of Things. And the Internet of Things will, will mean we'll see an explosion of data. We are, I think, at the beginning of only seeing the sort of data that is emerging. And I think even less we can imagine what we can do with that sort of data. Uh, and I, I think it's, it's, it's hard to comprehend where we will go. But what we definitely will see is that cities, connected cities, will be a main space where IoT will matter. Now, what we do here is we propose an environment that we call um, DBay, like DBay is an eBay for data. And so the idea is a bit to capitalize on, on the merging data, but asking us, what do we do with this? So if the digital economy is truly data rich, decisions that we make in corporations, decisions that we make as humans, and decisions that we will delegate to things. Uh, it's a bit like what, what Laurie has done, yeah? We just delegate your task to yourself. Um, in the future, we delegate things uh, to things. Um, and so that means also cars, homes, streets, traffic lights will have data intensive decision making processes. So the traffic light of the future tomorrow will be much more intelligent than the traffic light that we have today, which is quite static. So the question is where all this data comes from. Um, so we talk about data as a service. And for this, I need the technical infrastructure. And then Camilla and her team, they're very much working on that sort of storing data um, and, and making data available. Um, you need uh, legal insights. Uh, and we're all very sensitized, of course, to, to privacy aspects. Um, there, there's, of course, the analytical capability. And QUT, since a number of years, is, is producing data scientific talent. Um, but it's also the economic assessment, uh, the question of what constitutes the quality of data, how to provide data, uh, what are my customers uh, that I could find out there. And what we see is that the initial focus is probably more technical. We start to normalize data. It's like a, like a data modeling exercise. What sort of data do exist? In which boxes can I put them? Uh, but once I resolved the technical conversation, which seems to be globally the focus of big data, 
we'll talk in much higher spheres. Uh, this is why I imagine we will produce data economists. Um, you can Google this, you won't find it, but, but QT wants to be one of the first places where data economists are produced, uh, where it's less about the technicalities, but more the economic value proposition. Um, so DBay is a very similar um, approach to what you see with eBay. There's a provider side, those who sit on data, or those, because they see market, are willing to collect data. Um, there's, of course, the consumer side. Again, the consumer could be a large corporation, and the estimation is that 70% of our large companies today already purchase data. It could be you as an individual, or as a highlight, it could be your smart device, where you say, hey, I'm going now, but car, find the cheapest car insurance for me. Car, find the easiest way to the city, and home, make sure that you find the cheapest electricity provider this week. I'm gone. Um, and I let my think look for the data. And in the middle, what we see is an entire new sphere of jobs emerging. So the future of work will mean a lot of entire new exciting jobs will emerge. So people in the middle will just see raw data coming in, and I can analyze them, slice them, dice them, visualize them, pump them out on the cube if you want, and stream them to you every Monday morning. And that's a sort of value add. And we, we assume that that sort of value add will attract a lot of exciting new career paths. So that's a sort of um, idea we have in mind. Uh, connected cities will connect the physical space and the digital space. And what we have in mind with the precinct Queen's Wharf as an example, that could be a space where physical and data, physical and digital worlds come together. And the sort of data that you want comes together to you. Now, what it means, um, we carefully have to understand is this a supply or a demand driven market? Again, at the moment, it's maybe more supply drained driven conversation. We talk about open data and so on. We don't understand the kind of consumer side of data well enough. Um, in that space, we have to differentiate between a search engine and a find engine. Uh, we're used to search engines, but I, I predict in the future, we'll be surrounded by find engines, uh, which is much more sophisticated, but of course, much more the sort of recommender service we are used to. Again, we see this only in the infancy. Uh, what we do is like build an, an MVD, like a minimum viable D-Bay, uh, start with a small data set, and then get our hands around all the aspects in terms of what is feasible from technological view and a legal view, what is viable. So what's the business model? When can I start charge? And how do I charge? Is it a subscription model? Is it a one-off? Is it what we see a lot like a give and take, um, credit rating, aviation data, and so on, work on that sort of principle? Um, but as, as uh, Daniel highlighted, I also hope that Brisbane becomes the place on a global scale that gives birth to a new sphere of entrepreneurs. And we call them data tech or city tech. Uh, you might talk FinTech happens in Sydney, but hey, I, I hope that data tech on a global scale uh, will happen mostly and first of all here in Brisbane, uh, using our precinct as an example. Uh, what I hope and what we need, and that's our big chicken and egg problem here, is that very quickly we've got data economists uh, who can help us to design that sort of uh, debate that's not just technologically mature, but um, economically uh, viable as well. Thank you so much. Thank you, Michael and Camilla. Some inspiring um, thoughts there and challenges for us uh, here in southeast Queensland. Our final speaker. Dr. Monique Mann is a lecturer at the Faculty of Law School of Justice at QUT. She studied a Bachelor of Psychological Science and a Bachelor of Criminology and Criminal Justice with honours, majoring in police studies. She has also completed a PhD on the legal, intelligence and policing responses to transnational organised crime. She pursued this course of study because she's interested in the intersections between people, crime, policing and technology. Monique became interested in working in the area of privacy and information security after working as a consultant for the CrimTrack Agency, now known as the Australian Criminal Intelligence Commission. Monique was involved in the evaluation of large-scale police information systems that enabled cross-jurisdictional information sharing. She decided in that role that she was better suited to an academic career where she could critique the legal, ethical and privacy implications associated with information collection, storage and sharing 
And today, Monique will be speaking to us about privacy and information security risks of smart cities and the Internet of Things. Her ambition is to improve legal, regulatory and oversight frameworks of new information technologies. Please welcome Dr. Monique Mann. All right, well, thank you um, for inviting me today, David. Uh, I'm going to be speaking on privacy and information security, but I just wanted to start off with this quote that we kind of often hear repeated uh, when you work in the area of technology. So technology is neither good nor is it bad, but it's not neutral. And I really want to spend my five minutes today talking about some of the social implications uh, of um, smart cities and Internet of Things, uh, some of the human rights implications, uh, and also some of the risks when we think about privacy and, and also information security. So one of my main areas of research concerns uh, biometrics uh, and the use of um, biometric information for the purposes of surveillance. Um, we see here in Queensland, um, local councils, in this case Toowoomba, are really trialling this um, technology. Um, my concerns in relation to biometric information is because it enables the linking of an individual's um, presence in physical space with other potential data that's out there uh, about them, uh, including big data, uh, open source data, and also a range of other uh, government information uh, sources. So we see this uh, in Queensland. More recently, we have proposals to roll out this technology across all public transport uh, here in Queensland, aligned with the Commonwealth Games. Uh, and last week, indeed, I was speaking to a journalist who um, is reporting on Westfield shopping centres uh, implementing facial recognition technology uh, in combination with uh, public access, free public access Wi-Fi surveillance uh, for the purposes of targeted advertising. So there are a whole range of issues here I think that we need to consider. In terms of what's legally permissible, I mean, we can, we can think or speak about it in, in, this, in this way, uh, but I actually advocate that um, we need to think about sort of the, the, the broader legislative and human rights framework uh, in, in Australia, particularly in relation to privacy. So we actually don't have any constitutional protection of uh, human rights, including privacy rights in Australia. This is unique. Uh, you know, when we compare this situation to um, all other Western democracies, uh, we have no privacy tort, no cause for serious invasion of privacy. Uh, we don't have any relevant jurisprudence, as we also don't have a court of human rights. So in terms of um, smart cities uh, and other forms of um, surveillance in public spaces, I think we really need to consider issues of privacy in public spaces, behavioural monitoring, uh, data linkage, particularly that of biometrics, uh, issues of consent and opt-out. Uh, in my view, I think this issue of consent, when we talk about whether or not someone consent, consented to the information being collected, um, is becoming increasingly outmoded uh, in an in increasingly connected uh, society and sensor society indeed. So look, in the, in the five minutes, I also wanted to touch on another related issue, which is uh, data protection or information security. So uh, we saw a couple of weeks ago in the US, uh, a casino was hacked uh, with a large amount of data um, taken and sent offshore uh, through an internet connected fish tank. Um, so this is something that we really <laughs> need, need to be quite mindful of as well, is the, the potential for information risks through IoT devices. Uh, also here, again, in Queensland, um, adopting sort of a local approach, uh, we saw the introduction of very controversial security cameras uh, in Moreton Bay that also record sound. Now, these security cameras uh, were compromised, um, but the council has not uh, provided any details in relation to that. So we also see here issues of uh, trust, public trust, accountability, transparency. Um, and I think when we start to think about moving forward uh, with smart cities uh, and internet connected devices, we need to be very mindful about these sorts of issues. So we know that uh, internet of things or internet connected devices um, you know, are not always designed with information security in mind. Uh, when we think about rolling these out across cities or communities, for example, uh, they provide a very large kind of attack surface for potential um, malicious actors. Um, when we start thinking about monetizing or commodifying data, uh, this also, um, I think, creates additional risks that we need to consider. 
Uh, we often talk about uh, privacy by design, but I also think we need to start thinking um, much more seriously around uh, information security by design uh, and indeed um, a siloed information uh, storage and defensive uh, security architecture. So with those few points in mind, uh, I'll wrap it up there. Thank you. Thank you, Monique. So while uh, Camilla and Michael got us on a high about all the opportunities with data, you've brought us back down a little bit around the risks associated with it. I'd now like to invite all of our speakers up onto the stage and audience, we have about half an hour with these great people uh, where you can, you, you know, you've heard the surface of their um, areas of insight um, and the topics that they've shared with us, what would you like to know more about? We'll have some microphones coming around. Um, if I do go to you, if you could please start by introducing yourself and where you're from and uh, then pose your question. Now, while we're getting started, I might, um, might start with a question. Um, with you, Camilla, what's an example of data related to Queen's Wharf that might be useful to multiple stakeholder groups? Uh, yeah, well, um, the Department of State Development's really interested in generating a lot of local content, both in the construction materials and the people working on the site, but also things through to flowers, um, providing thousands of flowers that will be needed when it's in operation each day. So collecting data about what will be needed so that we can help Queensland businesses upscale their businesses to meet that demand would be something that would be valuable to multiple stakeholders. Wonderful, thank you. Um, Lou, I've got a question for you. You were talking about smart communities and how some of the challenges that councils are facing is they don't know what products are out there, what technology products are out there, they don't know which providers to trust, they're not confident in their own skills. Um, that's not a, um, those sort of sets of concerns aren't unique to councils, they're common to pretty much most businesses as well, or probably even us as individual consumers. Um, what advice would you give um, to organisations here in the room today on how to, um, how to solve some of those questions? Yeah, look, um, the, the approach that we're taking is, is little steps, put your, put your toes in the water. Uh, big believer in trials, proof of concepts. So before you have the large rollout, try to do something on a small scale, try to get some wins. Mm -hmm. and, and if you do, um, keep investing. Mm -hmm. So yeah, mitigate the risk by doing it on a small scale. That's good. I think Jim Collins called that um, fire bullets, then cannonballs yeah. in his book, Great by Choice. Um, audience, who has our first question? Down the back here? No? Sorry, Angela, did you have someone? Oh, I have one. No, okay. <laughs> okay, one here at the front. Um, could we have a microphone oh, sorry, here, please? Scott from Osmosis, and probably to Monique. Around the world, has anybody got the privacy stuff under control or improving it to a level that we can learn from, given what else is happening around the world mm. technologically? Uh, certainly, uh, and in my research I, I quite often draw a number of comparisons um, to the European Union and, and we see they're, they're in rolling out the new general data protection regulation which is expected to come into force next year. Uh, they also have a much better kind of system of human rights. So we've seen there um, a series of cases that have really reaffirmed um, that the collection and retention of um, biometric information and other forms of sensitive information uh, about individuals who have not been convicted of a criminal offence actually violates the right to privacy. Um, so in Australia it's a much different situation simply because we don't have constitutional protection of human rights, we don't have a court of rights, we don't, a, a court of human rights, and there's not really any really similar jurisprudence. So to answer your question in short, yes, I, I very much look to the EU um, in my research to kind of draw recommendations and apply them in an Australian context. Thank you. Uh, Cameron Cross from You Begin. Uh, thank you for the late invitation, Daniel. I'm curious about the challenges that you're aware of in um, uh, nurturing a human-centered design process to community development and actively engaging <laughs> local government and um, uh, sector leaders with community in, in an ongoing basis rather than point-in-time checks using technology on that basis. Yeah, I think, uh, I can't speak for the Department of State Development, but I think that's the intention. Uh, what we did was just an initial proposal of how a study might work if they ended up going ahead with the study. So that's sort of the point that we're at at this point. 
Um, but I completely agree with you that this wider um, engagement would be really useful in a precinct of that scale. Thank you for the question, Cameron. Marcus, um, I promised Danielle to ask a question. Marcus Foot, um, Professor of Urban Informatics here at QUT. Um, in some of our research, we are looking at um, the kinds of um, software tools and technology and the infrastructure used to deal with data um, that drives a lot of the smart city innovation. And a lot of it is then um, translated into recommender systems and the ways that we get information on our mobile devices and who to follow, what to consume, what kinds of coffee shops to go to. But the downside of that could be that potentially cities that used to thrive and Margaret provided a great um, reminder on diversity and the heterogeneity of so many different cultures coming together that we actually now polarize, that these kinds of recommender systems are actually creating echo chambers and filter bubbles, not just online, but actually echo chambers and filter bubbles in our cities. Um, I'm just wondering what um, some of the responses might be from the different perspectives of the panel members on that. Do you want to lead with that, Louis? Yeah. yeah. So we're, we're doing a lot of work at the moment, and you know we're looking at big data, I guess, from four key areas. Certainly, we want councils to be data-centric. So we recognise that you know, the, the traditional way that they make decisions is going to be really challenged. You know, if you think about, you know, as a manager, you probably looked at financial statements and tried to appreciate some trends. You relied on your own observations. Obviously, those days are gone when you've got so many devices being connected to the, to the internet. So this concept of how can we use data to make better decisions is, is front and centre of one of our strategies. The second area is the data itself. We recognise that um, when we talk to councils, a lot of the data is not real good. You know, we, we, our last survey recognised that only 8% um, of councils had high confidence in their data. So that's two councils. We were a bit alarmed by that. Then we saw what the, sort of like the, the national sort of averages were and some of the international averages were, which was around 19%. So we know that you know, in regards to uh, what we can do to encourage councils to take up better practices around govern governance, how the data flows through the organisation is something that requires some work. And indeed, I get a lot of the council CIOs talking to me about, look, whatever you're doing, you know, make sure that um, you know, the, the executive members, you know, the elected le uh, level of councils and the CI CEOs have that appreciation that data is important because that will really help us at the CIO level. So we've got some work going in there. Uh, the third area, of course, is skills. And you know, we, we want to start talking to, to universities and data analyst associations and business analyst associations. So that, you know. And data economists. And data economists, of course, um, wherever they may be, uh, ab about the opportunities that are in local government. Uh, and so, you know, we, we recognise that uh, while IoT and automation will threaten a lot of traditional jobs. We also recognise there's going to be a lot of job growth around data and creativity and all those sort of things. So, so really big focus on how can we start raising the profile around councils being a, a, an interesting place to work, particularly if you've got skills around data. And it's just not data from a, you know, um, uh, an analytic side, it's data from you know, the, the technical side, data from procurement side, data from a policy side. Uh, so recognising there's a lot of work there. And the fourth area that we're investing heavily in is um, the actual analytics hub, this sort of concept of how can we make data as a service for councils. So you recognise that you know, while we do have some very big councils along the coast in South East Queensland, we have a lot of smaller councils and we see that there's a, a great opportunity for us to help them you know, particularly when we start aggregating lots of different data, both open data and data that's you know, buried away within departments that could make some really good, good sense for councils. So we've got this four-pronged strategy that we're working through at the moment, it's big dollars. We've got some great strategic partners in companies like Accenture and Amazon, and uh, we're, we're hoping that as a result of that, we have councils that have a better appreciation of the value of data, we have better systems, we have the people, and also that capability that they can look at some of the stuff that they're doing overlaying it with, with data from other areas and hopefully come up with better decisions. Mm, that's great, Lou. Michael, do you want to add? Yeah, quickly. So I saw your tweet, Mark, it's only a time to read the abstract in the last five minutes. Um, <laughs> to, to comment, so um, the one is I think the, the city of the future will be hyper-personalised. Um, so, so let's say that the driving recommendations I get will be tailored to, to who I am and where I am. Um, and the second one is, I think the, the future will also be uh, community building. So I'm the honorary consul for Germans, for Germany in, in Brisbane. So how do I bring the Germans together in Brisbane? Uh, I think the old idea was there was physical community. It was like a neighborhood or people who work in the same street. Uh, I think the, the, the data center view in the city will create anti-new communities that otherwise would have never found each other. 
I might also comment that um, the collection of data isn't neutral as, um, as we heard, and also the analysis of right. data isn't neutral either. So that when we're actually analysing data and city councils are looking at data, it depends upon the lens upon which you analyse that data. So the city, um, I talked about city being full of people, it's full of very different types of people and people who have different needs and who have different, different wants. And they may use the city differently depending upon the context it is. And like Michael talks about it being individual, that's true. But also when city councils are making decisions, we have to think about the, the lens of, against which we're analysing that data because that also has, that's a value-laden decision when we're, when we're analysing it. So when we're creating, um, I guess, analysis and data and using it, think about the lens you're looking through, think about your own assumptions against which you're analysing that data. And I would just add to that as well. I, I totally agree with your points there. Um, for the you know past two decades, uh, people have been writing on issues of bias in computer systems, and particularly around the use of algorithms uh, to make decisions, automated decisions. Um, and, and when we're talking about things like cities becoming personalised, targeted advertising, and so forth, we've seen from studies that have been conducted um, already for example online and people's advertising online um, you know something as simple as writing um, or filling out you know your gender on a job employment website will show you a you know a selection of jobs with actually a lower starting salary than if you had indicated that you were male. So I also think that we need to be mindful about issues of bias, uh, the lens through which we see things, either bias that people impute or program into these systems, uh, but also the bias that kind of emerges from data sets in the way that we collect data and how that actually affects uh, the outcomes of these sorts of um, automated processes, uh, which becomes increasingly complicated when we start thinking about issues around um, machine learning as well, I think, in terms of m moving even more into the future. Speaking of bias, I might just uh, take a moment to acknowledge the excellent gender diversity on stage. <laughs> <laughs> um, you, I guess we've all heard of digital strategy and um, many, if not most, organisations have a digital strategy um, now. Uh, when I was listening to Michael and Camilla speak, it made me think about data strategy. And I'm just curious if you could raise your hand if in your organisation you have a data strategy. One, two, three, four. So I think of five. So that's, that's interesting, you know, when you think of all the issues and opportunities that have been raised here today, I think um, data strategies might be one of the, one of the new um, focal areas for leaders and of organisations. So flowing on from that particular thought, Michael, I wonder how close are we to making your DBay vision a reality? So I mean, data trading or data marketplaces exist since a number of years, so that's not a brand new idea. Maybe DBay as a label is a new idea. Uh, I, I think in the past they were often global or niche markets, and they were either driven by the technology but didn't have the right economic model. Uh, I think we needed to mature in terms of digital literacy of, of consumers. I mean, the, the point that you made, Monique, um, I think it's a question of people will mature. In the old days, I would go to financial analysts, and if I wouldn't get the right advice, I would go to someone else. And instead of an analyst, I'm talking to an algorithm, and, and people will mature, I guess, in terms of literacy. So I think we're at the tipping point where, where data trading and, and marketplaces become a reality because it's not just the technicality that we've resolved since years, it's also the economic model and the literacy of, of consumers and providers. So, uh, and having a, a, a decent playground like Queen's Wharf as opposed to very broad approach might, might allow us to, to, to learn using that sort of minimum viable data marketplace. That's great. Got a question oh, right here and then we'll go to you. Thank you. Hi, Justin Clackety from the Australian Privacy Foundation. Um, this is probably more for Camilla, Michael and Monique. Um, you're talking about data as a service, so monetization of that data. Um, listening to what you were saying, I couldn't help but think it was surveillance as a service. Um, this data is, you're selling it and it may well be available to law enforcement but also from an information security perspective you're going to have organised crime looking at these things um, and using that to identify vulnerable people. In the Queen's Wharf district there's a casino going in there I believe so you'll already have vulnerable um, people there. How do you protect those people and how do you protect that data um, in this in this system in Queen's Wharf. Shall I start? Yeah, <laughs> and then we'll go along the chain. 
Um, first of all, I think it's worth noting that there's a lot of data that's freely available now. Um, and um, it's not yet something that's an actuality that there's this debate for um, Queen's Wharf data, that they're just two ideas that were presented beside each other today. Um, I, what we would like to do if QUT were to run this study is to put together an advisory group that covers these areas so that even from the outset of the collection of data, we're really considering from an, indep an independent standpoint, looking at all the stakeholders' needs and values and issues of privacy, how we best collect this and how it's best used and secured. Um, so obviously there would never be a situation where we're trying to sell data um, that might be sensitive in nature, um, that could cause problems from a surveillance or security point of view for vulnerable people. Um, I, I can't speak for the casino. That's probably a good question for the casino, um, how they might use surveillance data. Um, but it would be great if um, if that is being legally connect, if, if that is being collected, that we're all sort of across what is being collected and what's the best way to govern that. Yeah, uh, uh, again, I'm not, I'm not talking on behalf of the casino. Um, so, so first of all, I, I believe a lot of jobs are emerging. Yeah? There's a data collector, the data economist, there's a privacy protector. So this will be healthy for our economy. Um, again, protecting privacy is nothing new. If, if I'm YouTube, I face this challenge all the time where people upload videos and I have to make sure that they're appropriate. Um, it's a bit like how we got spam out of our email inboxes. So I, I totally acknowledge this is a massive, massive challenge. Uh, uh, but I've got unconditional uh, confidence that humans and AI will help us to address this. Having, of course, in mind a lot of data that will be available, it's, it's not about humans, it's about building or maintenance data, weather data, uh, where issues are slightly different. Mm -hmm. I, I would just return to the point, um, just reiterating sort of the, the real absence of any privacy protections that we actually kind of have in practice and the enforceability of them. I think we need to be designing these systems uh, in mind with sort of privacy and regulatory kind of thought, uh, from, thought to those issues from the outset. Um, I think, uh, I mean, I'm not in any way affiliated with the, the Queen's Wharf project, but I certainly think that, you know, back to my point around the Moreton Bay Council, we need to have um, accountability, transparency and oversight of these type of developments so we can actually have some meaningful kind of community debate about them and I know that that project in particular has been kind of clouded by secrecy. Uh, in terms of um, the surveillance aspects, yes certainly that information could be provided to law enforcement but I also think we need to kind of have some regard uh, to issues of capitalist surveillance which is uh, essentially what we're seeing um, you know, with services such as Gmail where your emails are scanned for the purposes of um, targeting advertising to you. So this is in itself not problematic. So we, we, not only the law enforcement dimensions but also these kind of commercial interests uh, in individual data and, and that really ra raises quite serious kind of questions in my view around ownership of data, who owns data, who controls data and so forth, who benefits from that data. Um, and I think the only other thing that I would uh, add to all of that, um, yeah, I just think moving forward, th th these are really big questions that we, I think we have to confront. <coughs> Thank you for the question. Yes. Hi, Mark Burton from UQ Law School. In an age where privacy policies have become utterly pointless, mm. How can we design better strategies to inform individual citizens about the complexities of connectivity in a smart city? Mm. So for instance, the, the number of times that an individual may go to a toilet in their house can be a tradable asset in terms of the data that it, that's produced. We've How got some earth... from urban utilities here. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> How on earth do we try to explain that in a different way to individual citizens so that they can understand the consequences of supplying that data and what it means to be in a tradable data community and the consequence of having a poo on a toilet. <laughs> can I, um, I think different societies and different ages need different types of intelligence. Um, so 100 years ago, we, we boosted academic intelligence and people started to read and count. Um, then we developed emotional intelligence and this is now the age of, of digital intelligence. Um, today I can't buy a book from, from Amazon if I'm not online. I can't fly with Ryanair if I can't book online. I probably can't take part in certain therapies if I don't have a certain digital intelligence. Uh, so I think you make a very, very fair point that we have to boost digital intelligence across all the entire society. 
Um, if, I, if I take your toilet example, some people might argue in a retirement village that's a sign that my mum got up in the morning and I, 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 I've got peace of, of mind. So, so work out what is privacy and what is useful data. Um, I think it's something that we have to be very mindful. Um, getting back to the policy debate, I mean, you can boost intelligence in the society, but also have to provide the right scaffolding. We, we have to accelerate policy development. Um, I gave recently a presentation to the government talking about uh, uh, MVPs, minimum viable policies. Uh, we have to, have to do agile policy development, otherwise the gap between what's possible and what is regulated will get bigger and bigger. We only see a beginning. And I think we have to do to policy development what we've done to software development. And if we don't do this, the, the problem that, that you especially, Monique, talk about will get, get exponentially uh, worse. Thank you. Another question here at the front? Uh, and then one at the back. I love the concept of the, of the past informing the future. So from your experience, what's the one or two things that we can't forget about based on the past going into connectivity in the future? What should we learn from the most? Oh, uh, that's <laughs> very difficult. But um, I guess to, to, to give the broadest advice, uh, to, to be very cautious with the visions around optimism and, uh, and utopian uh, solutions, and also to think carefully about what is the proposed dystopia, because history has shown lots of times it's reversed, that we're in a rush to kind of achieve things that we see uh, as being very valuable uh, broadly, um, th that we miss, we, we miss what the real opportunity was. So you know, just all of this talk about uh, data, and you think this is the crude oil of the 21st century. Um, how are we going to use it? How are we going to? Um, be very careful because there's lots of optimism around it. There's lots of growth. There's lots of thinking about mm. new jobs and um, new communities. But if it, and at the moment, you know, as an American, I'm in a very dark place. So, <laughs> so excuse me for being a slightly negative, but I think there has never been a more important time for us to double down on human rights, um, to think about the choices that we are making and we are giving away. Um, and that we do want to make our own choices and we do want a kind of personalized world, but what do we give up in terms of our own freedoms and protections in that ease of access of, yeah, I want that book because I like this book and I like that song because I like that song. Um, so I just, I, I like that stuff and I get why we want more of it, but I, I just, I think we, slow down for a second. Um, and also, now, now I'm on a tangent, but I'll, I'll make it short. <laughs> Just listening um, you know, with the news coming out of uh, Texas and the flooding and um, the, the incredible human crisis uh, right now. Where is the data helping us with that? Like, how do we uh, evacuate cities? How do we plan for these weather events and these kind of catastrophic environmental um, challenges that we will continue to have? Mm. Um, and I'd love to see some focus on that as well. I um, just on that point, um, in my research for this event, I came across um, an initiative of the Rockefeller Foundation. Um, I don't know if anyone else has come across it, but it's a, it's a Cities 100 project where they are looking at cities at risk of major mm. issues and how data can be used to support those. And, the, and the, the learnings from situations that have happened in other cities can be shared around the world. So that's one to check out. Um, we had a question over here. Thank you. Yeah, hi, Brad Smith here. Um, question for you, Lou, um, in terms of infrastructure and, and council involvement. So councils uh, want to embrace, I assume, the smart community aspect, but they're really dumb councils, aren't they? Because they're not embracing um, mobile technology. In a lot of cases, they're opposing new towers and such, probably to protect communities. How can councils come to the table with the telcos to plan infrastructure more appropriately? <coughs> Yeah, that's a, um, an interesting question. It's uh, certainly, it depends where you are too. I think uh, w there was never too many issues trying to build a base station on the other side of the Great Divide. You couldn't put that infrastructure in quick enough. Um, certainly on the, uh, on the uh, coastal side, uh, a lot more challenges. And um, uh, look, I I'm, I'm not sure what the answer is. Certainly, uh, you know, we, we live on our mobile devices. You know, we're, we're a country where we have more, you know, smart and connected devices than, than people. It's how we, you know, interact socially, professionally, commercially. Um, uh, it, I just, I guess, you know, 
having good understanding as to the pros and cons could be a start. Close relationships with councils, trying to work with councils. I mean, we're seeing, you know, the, the evolution of mobile infrastructure as well as we go through the Gs, you know, 3G, 4G, 5G. So there's going to be different infrastructure requirements as, as well. Um, I always come back to, you know, hopefully better awareness and understanding of the benefits, countering with, you know, perceived negatives as a way of possibly going forward, but it's a challenge like building any infrastructure. Can I have a mic right down the front, actually? Yeah, thank you. Hi, um, David Fagan, QUT. Uh, my question is to Laurie, but more generally to the panel. Uh, and I think we heard from Lou about how um, the technology was, was really building um, connections in, in marginalised communities. Um, I'm interested though, Laurie, in the work you do, particularly um, in the ageing area, as to whether we're doing enough to make sure that the technology is building the connections with people who can easily sort of fall off the edge, or are we going to actually see that gap widen? What's your view on that? And more generally, if anyone else has a view on that. Thanks, David. Yeah, um, in the area of ageing, you probably have heard in, in the news that probably one of the um, most expensive um, aspects of ageing is healthcare. And one of the most expensive aspects of healthcare is social isolation. And so as we grow older and you become frailer, um, we lose the ability to get out, we lose the ability to connect with other people. And a lot of the responses has been um, in, in all countries is to give people iPads. So if you're frail and at home, um, we give an older person an iPad and we expect that, that they then can connect with the world. And whilst that might be true, and whilst they can get on the internet and they can also have um, Skype and FaceTime with their families, it, it has some unintended consequences in that um, if you can imagine being in your home and the only thing you can do is Skype or talk to someone, you actually don't connect with the outside world because people accept, expect that, okay, you're fine. You have someone to come in and clean your home, you've got an iPad, you're good to go. Um, you don't get out into the real world, you don't connect with a human. Um, people make all these assumptions and so I'm suspecting that as the, it's really interesting that as the digital response has occurred with older people, so has an increase in, in social isolation. So for example, what might happen is if we find out that um, if there, someone is going to the toilet four or five times, then they might get a phone call that you need to go check that out. But it, it takes away the person's responsibility for even thinking about that. Mm. And it also, if, if the person flushes the toilet and I as the daughter knows that they're, they're okay that morning, it takes away my responsibility to call my mom and to have a conversation and say, how are you? How's it going? So a digital response can, in fact, increase social isolation and make health outcomes even worse for people um, without that understanding that um, a response is, is actually a human response and not a robot. A robot is not my friend. Um, a robot can help me go to the toilet, but a robot can't give me a hug. It can't, it can't love me. It can't let me love it back. So I think we have to be very careful about the responses that we give, to, particularly to, to vulnerable people. And um, that a quality of life is actually about that human connection. Um, it is in, it is in, it's actually supported by the digital, and it's great to be able to do Skype, but you've got to speak to a human being. Mm -hmm. And you've got to connect with the, the outside world with nature. Thank you, Laurie. Who's been hugged today? <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully, <laughs> I have. <laughs> okay, we've got a question uh, just here. Thank you. Uh, good morning, uh, Sam Daly from KPMG. Um, the federal government's smart city plan highlights the need for investment in outcomes when they're investing in new infrastructure, and then drawing on the federal government's motive and linking it to Queen's Wharf, where they are uh, thinking about using data to make sure they get the outcomes of the project. How can we, in major projects moving forward, make sure that we are using data so the community has um, 
some understanding of whether the outcomes of the investment that governments are making are achieved and I guess engaging them through the process of huge investment decisions, for example, like Cross River Rail, which probably hasn't um, had the sort of data lens put over it in regards to capturing outcomes. Uh, Kim, I see the answer? <laughs> <laughs> answer. Um, I think it's worth noting that the aspirations of smart cities, and we used um, the EU smart city framework to help design what those desired impacts might be for Queen's Wharf. Um, and they have a range of social and um, economic factors. And one of the social factors is engaging community and in more than just a one-way dialogue, but a two-way dialogue. So that would be one of the ultimate goals um, that's in the proposed study. How long it takes to get there and how we get there is the big question if the study goes ahead. Um, but I think you're right. I mean, there's clearly so much um, community interest about data and security and these things and, and also how people are <laughs> how people are achieving um, the goals they're setting out to do. So that would certainly be an ideal um, is to have that two-way conversation and to have these sort of advisory groups where there's representation from different people um, to ensure all the stakeholders sort of meet at the table um, and can hear about the outcomes. Thank you. We have time for one more question right here. At the Lucky side. last. Make it a good one. Uh, it will be. They're all good, though. Good, good morning, Carsten Schulz from the Digital Technologies Institute. When we talk about smart cities, we heard the term communities. Now, me standing here, I am a community of approximately 40 trillion cells, and they all work together. I have sensors that feed me information. I have data networks that transport this information to a central processing unit. Each of my cells run three billion lines of code on an ongoing basis. Um, when I have sensory conflict, my brain resolves that so that I don't fall over. When I get hacked through a cold, I've got a defense <laughs> system in place. Um, I'm self-repairing lasts for hopefully 120 years, who knows? <laughs> that would be nice. My question is when we talk about smart cities and communities, and we've got all these wonderful things, we talk about all these things, is anyone looking at the similarities to biological systems? Is anyone taking a lead from the way that my 40 trillion components work quite reliably? And if you're interested, each cell consists of about 40 trillion atoms. Okay, that's a lot of, lot of moving parts. Anyway, my question is, do we look into the biology in order to learn from it, in order to apply it to smart cities? Was it a good question? It's a great question. <laughs> wow. The tribe has spoken. <laughs> um, it's really interesting because I had that exact conversation with someone earlier this week. So I'm not sure if anyone on our panel is looking at um, biology as a, as a <coughs> metaphor, as a, as a teacher for this, um, or anyone else in the room, perhaps. I, I, I maybe give an answer that's shorter than the question. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, there's a whole stream of research that looks at, 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 at birds and what I can learn from a bird when I design a plane. I'm not sure about the human body as an inspiration for the city, but I like the challenge. Uh, but have in mind, sometimes we, we are smarter than human bodies. Yeah? So if I would give you a new hand, you probably could turn around 360 degrees. Um, so, so in certain cases, of course, I hope that the smart city goes even beyond the benchmark uh, human. I know that in our res um, the research team at, at IFE that there are groups that are looking at a number of, um, I guess, more, not necessarily the human system, but um, natural systems mm -hmm. in terms of how um, nature interacts with each other. So it is around like bats and like Michael was saying, mm -hmm. birds. And, but it's also more like f in terms of um, a lot of the agricultural systems and so forth. So it's understanding the, the complex systems in nature and applying that to smart cities. So that is happening at, at QUT. That's great. Well, look, thank you for that final question. Uh, please join me in thanking all of our speakers and panelists. <laughs> It's, an, it's a really captivating topic. I think we could probably spend the whole day here in conversation with each other. And, 
and I guess some of the key yeah, takeouts are that it is complex, that there is there are interdependencies, there there are unintended consequences, there are incredible opportunities as well. And I guess our intention was to bring bring all of you together today to uh, foster this conversation. To make our closing remarks, uh, to make the closing remarks for today's event, it's now my pleasure to welcome to the stage Mr. David Fagan, who is the Director of Corporate Transition here at QUT. Thank you, David. Well, it seems like I'm also the Rhonda character from Utopia, <laughs> um, who is one of the least likable people on TV, so thanks for that, Margaret. <laughs> Look, um, Thank you very much, and, and this really is a connected city. I don't know how many hundreds of millions of trillions of cells make up this connected city, but uh, thanks for that reference. Um, our, our objective today was to just keep this conversation al alive, and it's certainly a very active conversation uh, that's happening in many places, but it's also happening in many places within QUT. Um, I want to thank uh, our speakers uh, this morning, uh, and in, in order, I'll, I'll refer to Margaret, but I'll, I'll thank Margaret again. Margaret, uh, Laurie, uh, Lou, um, Camilla, Michael, and um, Monique. Um, so thank you very much, much to all of you. Thank you to Danielle for again uh, moderating uh, this conversation. And as she said, we're up to about number 18 now. Um, so we'll be at 20 by the end of the year. Um, and um, uh, also thank you to particularly to Cathy McCabe who does so much work in the background to get this to happen. Uh, I've got a couple of things to show you and that's a green button, is that right? The big, the big green button. Uh, as I said, there's many ways we, uh, you can engage with us at QUT in this and uh, coming up uh, uh, QUTX which runs through the Graduate School of Business is uh, running a short course on smart cities and Marcus I think asked a question before and he's, he's uh, in, in central in that. Um, the Real World Futures program has been running here for the past two and a half years. Um, some of you have been many times, some of you this is the first time. We have our full day uh, conference um, in, on October 17. Um, if you've come today, we'll send you some information afterwards anyway, but registrations are now open for that. And that conference will cover issues ranging from health and money all the way through to, to uh, global conflict and, and global politics and how disruption is playing all the way through the ecosystem, through all those trillions of trillions of cells. Um, and uh, we'd certainly welcome your, your involvement in that. Today's event was put on uh, with uh, the help of the Institute for Future Environment at QUT and particularly uh, uh, with a lot of support from Laurie Byers. Uh, and I think Laurie and I have been talking one way or another about doing something like this for several years. So it's good to finally get it on the show. So I'd uh, like to just uh, tell you, take this chance to tell you a little bit more about the IFE. Thank you for coming. Uh, thank you for your engagement. And uh, we look forward to seeing you again.